question. Uh, before I get into the message, you don't have to answer it. You don't have to raise your hand. I'll raise both my hands for this question. But how many of us here and those online have made wrong decisions in our lives? I know I have, and if I had 10 hands, I would raise them all. But thank Jesus that he has given us a remedy for wrong decisions. He has told us to ask for forgiveness, to seek him, to repent, and to move forward in Jesus. And today I want to talk about a bad decision that Israel's King Saul made, and it cost him dearly. Let's pray. Father, thank you, almighty God, that we can open your word, break it open, Lord, sit at your feet, learn from you. And Lord, I just ask that you would energize this message, that the people's spiritual ears and eyes would be open to have what you would want them to have. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Title of the message is The Wrong Choice at Endor. And we're going to read from 1 Samuel 28, 5 to 7. It says, When Saul saw the camp of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart trembled greatly. When Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams or by Urim or by prophets. Then Saul said to his servants, Seek for me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said to him, Behold, there is a woman who is a medium at Endor. You know, as Christians, if you haven't figured it out, I'm sure you have, we are in daily battles spiritually. Uh, it, it's just the way it is, because when we step forward and accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, the devil doesn't like it. And yes, we have an enemy, and his name is Satan. He doesn't like it. And he'll try to buffer us and he'll try to tempt us with all sorts of things. But in these times, we need to go to the Word of God. We need to go to him in prayer. We need to read what his Word says and then do it. We look to Jesus and we ask God, the Holy Spirit, to teach us the way that we should go. Never go to me mediums because the Word of God prohibits this. Uh, I always say... Can you imagine you're going to go to some doofus that's going to tell you something about you they don't even know you about in the future or what's happening here? Or the best is, I, I'm sure you've seen this on TV, call the California psychics. Yeah, let it stay in California. We've got enough psychics right here. Uh, and they charge you a, a, minute, a, a, a dollar for every minute. Now you think about that. They're going to keep you on the line for 15 or 20 minutes telling you how great you are and all this other stuff. Please don't listen to any of these people. They're in a back room somewhere. They have no idea who you are or what you're going through. Ephesians 6.12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual force of evil, in the heavenly realms. As Christians, we can defeat evil spirits. We do it every day, but we cannot do it in our own strength. We cannot use human weapons or human resources. For this, we need spiritual strength and that God will provide it. We stand firm. We resist in the mighty name of Jesus. You know the scripture that says, James 4, 7, submit there, for to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. A lot of people quote the other end of it. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. They forget the first part. No, first we got to go to God. First we got to lay everything at his feet and obey what he asks us to do. And then the devil must flee from us. So church, do not be afraid because the Lord is on our side. He has given us victory and he has given us spiritual weapons to combat all these things that come against us. Read about them in Ephesians chapter 6, 10 to 19. It's called the armor of God. And no person in our military goes into battle half equipped. We have all the necessary equipment to do the job that our military 
will do, of course, provided that those in authority will let them do it. I just remember when I was a young, uh, young guy, and I worked in this place. It was 100 years old. Well, what's the difference? It was 100 years ago. And the locker room was on the fifth floor. And we climbed up there. No elevators, no air conditioning. Actually, the bathrooms were great. They had no doors on the bathrooms. Can you imagine this? You thought you were in the army. There's no doors on the bathrooms. I said, I'm never going in here. Yeah, you go in there. But if I forgot something, and I didn't want to climb those five stairs, I did. Because I wouldn't go out in the street half equipped. I needed every piece of equipment to do the job that I was hired to do. Well, same in the spiritual. God has provided everything that we need to survive in these spiritual battles. And let's look into King Saul's life today and find out what happened to him. What hindered him? And how did he get to this place at this time in his life? Point number one. Saul made a wrong choice to go to Endor. We all make choices every day. And it's the important choices that we need to spend a little time and we ask God to help us. This is what the Holy Spirit does down here. He leads us, he teaches us, he guides us. So we need to spend a little time on these important decisions. And I made a little note here. Now, if you want to pray to God in the morning, should I have toast or an English muffin? Be my guest. I'm not saying that God will not hear that prayer. Uh, really, have the English muffin. Uh, reserve the big ones for the Lord. We know that Samuel was Israel's priest, judge, and prophet. And he was dead. And when Israel was in need of God's wisdom, he wasn't there at this time. Samuel was always there to rescue them. But God was and is always here to help us, just as he was always there to help Israel. Remember also that Jesus is our prophet, our high priest, our apostle, and our king. Now, King Saul was in trouble. Samuel wasn't there to give him any kind of God's counsel. But like I said, he needed to go to God, which he did, but then he didn't wait. He ran ahead. Without a clear direction from the Lord, and we move in on our own strength and our own imagination, what we think is right, the outcome could have undesired effects for each and every one of us. Saul needed to continue to pray and to wait. And that is a tough one. There are some people that are really good at waiting. I am not one of those people. Uh, I always joke that I'm not waiting on a line. Uh, you know, we were at the diner one time, and they said it was a half hour. I'm not waiting a half hour to have eggs. I'll go somewhere else. I'm not a patient person, so I need some help in that one. But it is amazing that uh, Saul would seek a medium. Because in the third verse of 1 Samuel, he outlawed and got rid of such practices from the land. Too many times Christians run ahead of Jesus instead of waiting for his answer. We get impatient and we say God is not hearing us. Folks, God hears us. When we say God is not hearing us, that's a lie. Because God hears everything. And in Isaiah 40, 31, it says, Yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. And John 9, 31, We know that God does hear sinners. But if anyone is God-fearing and, uh, God and does his will, he'll hear us. He doesn't hear sinner's prayers. Now, let me qualify that. If a sinner approaches God and asks for repentance truly from his heart, God is going to hear that. But these people that run around and continually disobey, continually practice sin, God is not listening to them. God hears each and every one of us as children. Wait for his direction, church. Saul began correctly by seeking the Lord, but when God didn't answer him in a timely fashion, in a time that Saul wanted to have his questions answered, 
He panicked. He went off the rails. And he did what is a sin according to the Bible. He knew it and he did it anyway. The word of God condemns all forms of spiritism, witchcraft, divination, mediums. Saul knew all this and yet he sought after a medium which was forbidden in Israel and in God's word. Also at this time in Israel, the people's faith was eroding from God because of the leadership of King Saul. Deuteronomy 18, 10 to 11 says, There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, one who uses divination, one who practices witchcraft, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who casts a spell, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. This is all written in God's word. Saul knew it. The people knew it. And he just went along and did what he wanted to do. Saul knew this, and he went ahead and did it his own way anyway. And that's a good lesson, number one, for us. Sometimes we think we're doing the right thing. But sit a while with God. Open his word. See what he has to say to us. He will never lead us to an area that's not good for us. That's not one of the attributes of God. He will always help us. Point number two. Saul did start out with some good qualities. In 1 Samuel 28, the latter part of verse 3, it says, And Saul had removed from the land those who were mediums and spiritus. He did. Saul also enjoyed some military victories and was considered a good military person. And when you read 1 Samuel, you will read in chapter 8 that Israel demanded an earthly king to rule over them, just as all the other nations around them had a king. Israel made a wrong choice here. The other nations had an earthly king, but Israel had the king of kings and the lord of lords. They didn't need an earthly king. Can you say amen? We have the king of kings and the lord of lords in our hearts we got it all when we got Jesus. Yes, we're going to go through battles. Who said we wouldn't go through battles? Jesus already told us that we're going to have tribulations. We're going to have trouble in this world, but fear not. And that's the statement we should hang on to. Fear not, because we sit in the palm of God's hands. 1 Samuel 9.2 He had a son whose name was Saul, a choice and handsome man. And there was not a more handsome person than he among the sons of Israel. From his shoulders and on up, he was taller than any of the people. So Saul was taller than all the others. In America, I think, people feel that height is a prerequisite for being wonderful, handsome, a strong person. I'm sure we've all heard of that. Or oh, you hear some of the women, not picking on you women, uh, who say they want a man who is tall, dark, and handsome. <laughs> what a bunch of nonsense that you're going to think because somebody is tall. By the way, I always wanted to be tall. It wasn't in the cards. <laughs> that automatically, because they're tall, credits him with being a good human being. Look at the content of a person's heart. See the way a person speaks and acts. God told Samuel to, uh, Samuel to anoint Saul as king. Most people were for him, and his future looked good. Then what happened to Saul? What happened was he took his eyes off God. He did what he wanted to do. You know, I'm sure we can all say this. I know I'll say it. Anytime I take my eyes off the Lord and start to wander in my own strength or in my own imagination is when I begin to stumble. Israel did it time and time again, following after these idols and these false gods and these mediums, and it can go on and on and on until God had to bring them back down to their knees where they looked up and not down. And sometimes he has to do that with us. We can become victorious overcomers, because we have a victorious God. Can you say amen? amen? You know, in golf, this is for Pastor Steve, by the way. 
When you take your eye off the ball, Pastor, and you swing the club, you're not going to hit the ball very far. Now, I'm laughing because the last time we went out, <laughs> two times I took my eye off the ball, and he knew it right away. I said I wanted to kill it. He said, yeah, I know. The ball goes nowhere. We have to keep our eyes on Jesus. Keep ourselves in the same line as the Lord. Never mind what the newspapers are saying. Never mind what these politicians, these windbags have to say. Keep your eyes on Jesus because in him is truth and absolute truth. Amen. Same in the spiritual. So we need to keep our eyes on the Lord. At the end of 1 Samuel chapter 31, we read how Saul, a man who should have been walking with God, was reduced to misery. And he eventually lost his kingship and, come, and had come to a tragic end in his life. Each one of us believers in Jesus know that he has a plan and a purpose for us. But we have to roll into that plan. We can't sit on the couch and have a cup of coffee and say, okay, give me the plan, Lord. No, he has a plan for us, and it's right here in the Bible. What we should do and what we're not allowed to do. He's not a killjoy. He is protecting us. You know, a little in the 80s, this big thing came about AIDS, right? We all heard about that, those that are old enough. And what does God say in his word? Don't be a fornicator. Don't be an adulterer. He's not being a killjoy. He's saving us from maybe some potential disease that's out there. 1 Peter 2.9 says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Every one of us have been called from a place where we could not get ourselves out of. And it was a dark place. I don't care how good you are. You heard me say this before. I thought I was a perfect person. I thought I did everything right. I'm not perfect. I'm 99%. She's over there. You can ask her later. <laughs> it wasn't until I came to the Lord, and that was 48 years ago, that I realized I needed a Savior. God has chose us purely because of his love for us and because of his grace and his mercy. He extends that to all people, to all nations and all tongues if we look to Jesus as our Lord and Savior. As followers and believers in Jesus, we are recipients of God's grace. We are recipients of his mercy. We are his workmanship. Point three. Okay, what happened to Saul? I told you before. Saul, what happened to Saul is the same thing that happens to every human being that ever walked the face of this earth who once was a follower of God, who loves God, who followed the Lord Jesus, but then took their eyes off who they were supposed to keep their eyes on. President Reagan said this, Debbie, don't get excited. I'm going off the rails a little bit here. Just stick with me. He said, if we ever forget that we are one nation under God, then we will be a nation gone under. This nation, America, was founded on the godly principles of, that he has given us. Look into our past history. There was no way a bunch of farmers with pickforks could ever defeat the best trained army in the world, 6,000 British troops. No way in the world except that Jesus wanted this country as his own possession, and he had it for a long time. Unfortunately, and I don't think I'm the only one saying this, we are drifting further and further away from God. And they wonder. They wonder why we're having these problems. They have all these degrees, master's degrees and PhDs. I'm going to tell them. A general diploma graduate from John Adams. Now, I do have a couple of college degrees. But here is the answer, folks. Not this stupidness. Pick it up. Right here, he'll tell you what is right and what's wrong. Amen? Amen? So Saul moved away from God. He was not performing his role as a king under God, obeying God. He was trying to do his own thing. And if you read in 1 Samuel 17, 11, it's the story about Goliath 
taunting Israel. Now, we, I think we've all heard that story, even if you haven't read it. It says that Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistines. They were dismayed and greatly afraid. Let me translate that. They were shaking in their boots. Now, this guy was nine feet, nine inches tall. The biggest uh, individual I had under my care was seven feet tall. So I told my partner, jump on my shoulders and we'll be the same height as him. When you see somebody seven feet tall, let me tell you, that's pretty big. Imagine a guy nine feet, nine inches tall. Wow. Israel forgot, though. They were scared stiff. And that's a human condition. We all get scared. Don't, don't tell me that you're not scared. And any soldier in combat who says he's not scared, jump in another foxhole. Because there's something seriously wrong with that person. We all get scared at times. I was scared many times. You could ask Pastor Jeff or Pete. We were all scared in our previous uh, job. However, it didn't stop us to the point from not doing our job. We did it. But here they were tied up. So what happened to them? God took them out of slavery. This is what they forgot. God took Israel out of slavery from Egypt. Not only did they march out of Egypt, they marched out with gold and silver and food and clothes and everything else they needed. They crossed the Red Sea on dry land. They forgot. They were fed with manna and quail in their 40-year march. Their clothes never wore out. Their shoes never wore out. The walls of Jericho fell without the nation of Israel throwing one arrow or spear. How do you forget all of this stuff in your history? Church, Jesus saved us. He redeemed us. And we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Let us never forget that. And Bob had mentioned that we got to know when people ask us, why do you believe the way you believe? You can't say, well, I don't know. My pastor said this, and I heard this guy on TV. No, open this book. Read it, study it, be approved, be a workmanship for God. Go out there and don't be afraid of these people. You stand up, we're the head, we're not the tail. We got God on our side, they don't, amen? But they need what we have. Remember, we were where they are. I didn't know anything about God till I was 26 years old. Jesus promised never to leave us, so let us rely on God all the time. They showed a lack of faith, Israel. This big guy came out, they were scared stiff. Israel had put their trust and their faith in a human king instead of relying on God. Even though Saul tried to root out divination in Israel in accordance with what the word of God said, he resorted to these illegal means again on finding God's will. That, that's a shame. And when you read the history of Saul, you will discover that for most of his life, he wanted to do things his way and only his way. Saul's character was flawed. Character means the pattern of behavior or personality found in an individual. Every human being, you and I here, have a character flaw. It's called sin. But thank God we put it on the cross where Jesus was nailed. We put our sin on that cross, and he graciously has forgiven us and he even has forgotten the sin. So you may say, you mean God forgot all about that? If he's God, how could he ever forget? He chooses not to remember the sin when we give it to him and begin to walk in his steps. But we are overcomers. When we do this, we overcome by trusting in Christ who died to pay the ransom price for us. We could never pay that price. We could never get out of where we were. Jesus had to come back down to this earth, and he will come back another time. And he hung on that cross to make us righteous, that we could be in a right state back with God the Father. With Jesus, our sin character has been defeated. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things pass away, and behold new things come. That's right. We have a change of attitude. Now that old man will try to sneak up. He tries to sneak up to us all the time. And uh, if you're driving, I know most of these are very good at driving. Um, sometimes I'm not. Uh, sometimes when I see people doing stupid things with their cars, 
Uh, I, I always tell Marianne, that would be the 23rd thousandth and first summons I give out. Uh, and then she'll tell me, now you have to be patient. You must be patient. So she puts me back in line again. We as Christians have been redeemed, restored, and we have a new attitude. Isn't that great? Our old hard heart is thrown out. And we have a nice, soft, pliable heart that God can work with. I want to read you a true story about a character. His name is Dick Morris. Dick Morris was an advisor to President uh, Bill Clinton. He resigned suddenly from the White House. He gave the following explanation to a Detroit newspaper. Morris said, I started out being excited working for the president. Then I became arrogant. Then I became grandiose. And then I became self-destructive. He said he had a fundamental weakness in my personality, a fundamental sin, and if you will. I'm prone to being infatuated with power and believing that the rules don't apply to me. Wow. Maybe that's the way we all were. Well, we didn't work for a president, but maybe we thought, hey, the rules don't apply to me. It's all right. I'm doing good this week. I'm okay. I don't need God. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. That describes Saul perfectly. Sin mastered him. If we would have turned to God fully and did what God told him to do, he would have gone on to do great things for the Lord. We all need to put down the old man, every one of us. So how do we do this? By going to the Lord and pray, read the scriptures, and here's a big one, avoid any situations that would lead us to sin. I think I was telling the guys yesterday in the men's group, so forgive me if you heard this one. When I was a baby Christian, I was sent down to Coney Island. Um, we had a bolster of horse cops that were down there because they needed our help. And anyway, I'm walking around with a bunch of these other guys, and there was a strip joint. And they all said, we're going into the strip joint. Now, I was a new Christian, very new Christian. I'm not walking into the strip joint. I didn't want to go in there because I knew that my mind would be carried away to areas that it shouldn't be. So they said, are you coming in? I said, no. They said, why not? Instead of saying, because I'm trying to follow God and this isn't what God would want me to do, I didn't know. I said, I got a headache. <laughs> oh, boy. I didn't live that one down for years. I, could, I want to tell you. Oh, they all made fun of me on that one. But don't go to where you might be involved in a sin. Stay away from it. In Saul's kingdom, he wrongly thought that he could do what he wanted to do and not what God asked him to do. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, Samuel, uh, Saul was to wait seven days. The time was set by Samuel. Samuel was going to come, and he was going to do the sacrifice that only a priest could do. Well, uh, Saul said, he's not coming, so I'm going to do it. You can read this in verse, uh, 1 chapter 13, 9. So Saul said, bring me the burnt offering and the peace offerings, and he offered the burnt offerings. Only the priests were allowed to do this. Even though Saul was a king, this was not his task from God. And this was not the right thing to do. And in verse 13 of chapter 13, Samuel said to Saul, you have acted foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. Again, the Lord told Saul through the prophet Samuel to strike and attack the Amalekites and spare no one. I'm not God. I don't know why he would say this, but this is what he said to do. So when you read that in 1 Samuel chapter 15, Saul did not do what God asked him to do. He saved King Agad's life and he also saved some of the choice uh, oxen and sheep. And when Samuel confronts him and says, you have rejected the word of God, you didn't do what you were supposed to do. What does he say? He starts to make excuses. You ever see that with your kids when they were younger? Who broke this glass? I don't know. I think it was Frank. I think he broke it. They make excuses 
what, what Saul should have done was drop to his knees and ask for forgiveness and ask Samuel to plead his case before the Lord. He didn't do that. He started making excuses. The last point, point number four, Saul lost his kingdom. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Saul didn't finish the race. He lost it all, his own kingdom and maybe even his God. Saul made a wrong choice at Endor. You can read the whole story in the Word of God in 1 Samuel. Church, we have the complete living Word of God for us to read and to see what God requires of us. Let us stay close to Jesus and do what is right in the Lord's eyes. Not what people tell us is right, but what does God say to do? Someone once told me at a meeting, and I was on this particular board, and something came up, and uh, I said, wait a minute, this doesn't sound right. And the guy next to me said, no, no, it, it, it doesn't matter if it's right or wrong. Now, we were all Christians, supposedly. It's what is illegal and legal. And I said, no, and I resigned from that board. It does matter what is right or wrong, especially in God's eyes. Saul died a tragic death. He didn't have to end his life this way. God's power and wisdom and direction was available to him as it is for us today. I want to close with this. What lessons can we learn from King Saul to assist us in our daily walk with Christ? Well, first, we need to pray to the Lord and wait for his answer. Now, folks, this could be a difficult thing because I have to tell you, when something comes up and it's tragic and, and it's an emergency, I want to pray, and I do, and I want the answers like two seconds after I pray. But that's what I want. I'm not God. I'm Joe. Thank the Lord. He's God, and he will do it in his time. What I have to do is what the Word of God tells me to do, to be an intercessor, to pray for those who are in need, whatever that need may be. That's what I do and what Christians do. We're not God. I couldn't heal a flea with a headache, but God can do it. So what is my job? What is your job? It's to pray to God and be earnest in our prayers. Second, don't run ahead of the Lord. We all want answers to our prayers right away, but if God is not answering those prayers right away, well, then he has a reason. And if God doesn't answer immediately, this doesn't mean that his answer isn't on the way. Third, never go or do anything that is against what is in God's word. Mediums, witchcraft, horoscopes, horoscopes, that's another one. You got 15 old ladies in a back room somewhere in Montana, and they're, do not cross the street, you'll get hit by a bus. There's 300 million people in America, somebody going to get hit by a bus. Don't believe these phonies. They're all prohibited by God. Tarot cards, burn them if you have them. Palm readers or Ouija boards, burn all of this stuff. Don't even throw it in the garbage, burn it. Stay away from it all. And don't make excuses as Saul did when Samuel confronted him. Lastly, attend church. I can't say this enough. This is so important. We need to fellowship with each other. We need to sit and hear and listen to the word of God. Now, I'm old-fashioned. You can see me in the back. I am always jotting down notes. I'm not jotting down notes to catch the pastor in an error. No. I'm jotting down notes so that when I go home, I want to reread it in a couple of different translations to make sure I understand what pastor is talking about up here. You can't get it all in 40 minutes. You just can't. So I take a little notes. And I always have, I don't have a phone. I know you're all relying on that phone. I look at the Bible, the written word of God. Now, we, we just had a Zoom meeting. Thank God I have my secretary who got me on the Zoom meeting because I don't know what I was doing. <laughs> Lastly, we need to attend church. David Jeremiah said this that about Christians. Christians now, they're only attending church two times out of five Sundays. That's not good, folks. Uh-uh. That is not good at all. This is God's house, and we are God's people. 
We are part of the body of Jesus Christ. We need to get together. We need to hear the word of God and pray and uplift each other. Go downstairs and have some fellowship. And if you're new here, please go downstairs. Whoever makes the coffee does a great job. Trust me, it's good coffee. I told Pastor Steve I'm going to get the Nobel Peace Prize because I figured out we use a half a tin of big coffee for seven pots. But go down there and fellowship. This is what we need to do. We don't need to run out and watch some ball game. The ball game will be there when we go home. We need to fellowship with God more often. We got to do better. Now, of course, if you're physically not able to come to church, well, thank God we can get on these life sites and we can hear the word of God. But if you're physically able to get to church, how many times do I have to say it? You need to be in church. Let's pray.